Robin Lawrenson. I'm a landscape photographer based out of Calgary, Alberta. I have been working with Nikon Canada now for about five years and I've also worked with major tourism partners out here in Alberta like the City of Calgary, Tourism Calgary and Travel Alberta. I am very excited today to be sharing my five top compositional tips for landscape photography. I truly believe that these are the five essential compositional tips that you need when you're approaching a scene. So this presentation will include three things. One, the essential gear that you need for landscape photography. Two, the apps that I use to plan my photo shoots. And three, the five different compositional tips I use for photography. I will also be giving a lot of examples, visual examples on location so that you have a really good idea of what to look for when you are out shooting your landscape photos. So first, let's talk about gear. What is the essential gear that you need as a landscape photographer? So this is just the base, the foundation, the tools that you need to take amazing landscape photos. So you will need a DSLR or mirrorless camera. I shoot with two cameras, the Nikon Z5 and the Nikon D7500. The Nikon Z5 is a mirrorless camera and it is full frame and the Nikon D7500 is a crop sensor camera. And it is not mirrorless, it is just plain DSLR. The second thing you'll need is a wide angle lens. Every landscape photographer should have a wide angle lens in their arsenal. If you're shooting with a crop sensor camera, I recommend a lens that is 10 to 20 millimeters. And if you're shooting with a full frame camera, then anything that is 14 to 24 is a really great camera. On my Nikon Z5, I've been shooting with a 20 millimeter prime 1.8 because I also like doing astrophotography. And so this is a fantastic lens for astrophotography in addition to landscape photography. You will also need a polarizer. Mine is already attached to my camera. It practically lives there. What a polarizer will do for you is it will cut glare out of out of your images. So for example, if you're photographing water, it'll cut the glare off the water, allowing you to really see what is underneath the water and capturing really beautiful reflections. Also for glass, on snow, so a polarizer is a must have. Then you will also need an ND filter. What the ND filter does is it serves to block light from entering your camera and then it allows you to really slow down your shutter speed. So Long exposures are really wonderful, and that is one of the compositional tools that I'll be sharing, but long exposures are really wonderful for showcasing movement in a scene. I personally like variable ND filters simply because it's like getting four filters in one. So this is a five to nine stop variable ND filter. And so I can basically change it and it adjusts the darkness and, and how much light is I am allowing to get into the camera. But if you have to choose one, maybe the variable ND filter is not for you, then the one ND filter that I recommend is the 10 stop ND filter. You will also need a shutter remote release. This one that I have is a Nikon a shutter remote release. I just connected to my camera. And basically you need this if you're doing exposures over 30 seconds, simply because most cameras do not allow you to go over 30 seconds without having to switch to bulb mode. And at that point, this will allow you to shoot long exposures longer than 30 seconds. So you can do one minute, two minute, three minute long exposure if you wish. And last but not least, you will need a good sturdy tripod to do those long exposure shots or to do focus stacking in some cases. Now I'm going to discuss the apps that I use to plan my photo shoots. Really, there's three main apps that you should have on your phone. App number one is windy.com. So windy.com, you can either go to their website to windy.com or you can download the app Windy. What I use Windy for is to determine wind speeds, especially if I'm out chasing reflections. If it's a zero, to five, degree, to five kilometer wind gust, then you're looking at perfect conditions for those mirror reflections. Anything that's yellow, orange, or red territory, then you might as well not go to anywhere where you are expecting to shoot reflections because you're most likely not gonna get any kind of reflections. The second app that I use is My Sunset app. My Sunset app takes into account the amount of clouds, the sunrise at a particular location to determine if you're gonna get a really colorful sunrise or sunset. We know that photography is all about color, it is all about light, and who doesn't love a really good epic sunrise or sunset? So before I go out, I like to double check with my Sunset app 
So for example, I'm going to go here and I'm going to open my sunset app right now. And I'm able to plan the days that I want to get up for sunrise or go for sunset. So here it's telling me that I have an 89% chance of a really epic sunrise tomorrow in BAMP. So that's on Monday. That means that at 89%, I'm looking at extremely colorful conditions. So it is worth getting up at that sometimes really, really early in the morning to drive out a couple of hours to go to BAMP. And finally, the third app that you might be interested in downloading is the Photo Pills app. If you are very unfamiliar where the sun rises, the sunset, where the moon rises, the Milky Way, Photo Pills will actually paint a virtual reality of where the sun is positioned at any point in time. So this is really great if you're planning to shoot looking for the sun. If you don't know where east or west are, then this is a really great um, app to have, especially for nighttime photography, for astrophotography. A lot of photographers use it to shoot the moon or shoot the Milky Way, and it is extremely useful. It is probably one of the best photography apps out there. Now we're going to get into the five compositional tips that I recommend for taking really great photos. First and foremost, my very first one is using foreground, the element of foreground. For this, you will want to use your wide angle lens because the superpower of the wide angle lens is to make the objects that are right in front of you to seem very large and to make objects in the distance seem very small in comparison. Yeah. Using the wide angle lens to maximize the size of the foreground gives you a very unique and creative perspective that is very unusual to find. What having a foreground does is that introduces the element. The element that feels closest to the picture, it basically introduces and sets the scene. So typically these photos are composed of three elements, the foreground, the background, and then there's a middle ground that tends to connect. So for example, in some photos I can have like a rock as the foreground, the mountains in the background, and then you have a body of water that connects the two. And what this ultimately does is that it creates a 3D image in, a, in some way by creating that depth in the photo, by giving us, the viewers, something that you feel that you can reach and touch. And then it establishes a distance with the, um, with the foreground in the back. The second compositional tip that we're going to discuss today is the long exposure. What is the long exposure? You're basically slowing down your shutter speed in order to create blur, motion, movement, or to smooth out water in your photo. While a fast shutter speed freezes time and captures action as it is, just as that moment in time, a long shutter speed will create movement in the photo. It'll give you that illusion of movement. I really love using long exposures, especially when it comes to waterfalls, if there's a lot of clouds and you want to create beautiful streaking clouds, or even to capture vehicle movement, trains, cars, to capture those trail lights. To shoot a long exposure, you will need your ND filter. I like having a 10 stop ND filter, especially during daytime long exposures because it'll block a lot of light, allowing you to do up to one minute of a long exposure. You will need your shutter remote release if you want to do a long exposure that is longer than 30 seconds. Although if you just want to get the silky waterfalls or smooth water, one to two seconds is long enough. Compositional tip number three is your subject for scale. It is very hard for a viewer who has never been to your particular scene to really understand the magnitude or how big a scene truly is, unless you provide them with a point of reference. If you take a picture of a waterfall, the viewer might not know unless there's a reference point that it is a really big waterfall or a very small waterfall. And so adding a reference point that is very familiar to the viewer will give them a sense of scale. Secondly, it'll make that person and especially if you're incorporating a subject, feel like they're there and envision themselves being at this specific location. Some things that you can use for subject for scale, a vehicle, a person, an animal, even a house. Compositional tip number four is the use of leading lines. So leading lines basically serve to lead the viewer straight to the subject that you want that person to see or pay attention to. These can be very direct lines, sometimes like a road shot that leads to an epic mountain. And sometimes it can be something that's more textured or patterned, but still creates a line. It creates an arrow that will lead the viewer straight to the subject. The last thing you want to do is for your leading line to lead the viewer outside of the image. So typically it'll start closer to the front of the, of the person looking at the picture, and then it'll extend into the photo as an arrow to point the user 
to the actual subject that you want to see. And finally, the fifth compositional tip that I recommend is framing. So what is framing? Framing is using elements within your scene to basically frame your picture, very much like a picture frame would work. Framing works to give your photo sometimes photographic context. So for example, if you're using your car window to, to frame that photo, it lets people know that you're taking that picture from the car, that you're driving your car, and that the scene, you're shooting it from your car. So it gives that context. It can create depth. And finally, it does also lead the viewer to the subject that you're wanting them to pay attention to. Things that you can use for framing are doorways, windows, archways, trees, branches, grass, flowers. There's many things that you can use to your advantage to create framing. Thank you so much for watching this video. I hope that you found it very valuable and that you use some of these tips to go out and enhance your photos, take your landscape photography to the next level. Thank you so very much for watching and happy shooting.